hi everybody from my side. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening with those virtual presentations. You never know uh, where people are joining from. So uh, depending which part of the world you currently are, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, as I said, I'm happy to be with you today. And uh, first of all, thanks to Wahid for inviting me to present for uh, Persian Power BI user group. So before we start, I will just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. Uh, I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but uh, for the last six years or so, I live in a wonderful city of Salzburg in Austria, uh, where I work as an independent data platform consultant and trainer. Uh, living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen this nickname, Data Mozart. Probably you know that Salzburg is worldly famous as a birthplace of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, so I was brave enough to use uh, his last name as part of my nickname. And that's why I'm trying to make music from the data. Uh, you can find me on the web. I'm regularly blogging at data mozartcom I'm also active on social media like LinkedIn and Twitter. So feel free to, to connect if you like. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, I'm Microsoft Data Platform MVP and Microsoft Certified Trainer. And also I authored some courses for plural site on uh, Power BI and data related topics. OK, so what should you expect today from this session? Uh, well, I like to tell the stories. So don't expect a normal session today. Uh, I want to tell you a kind of a story, a story about a wonderful tool that we all love, and this tool is Power BI, of course. And in my story, you will be a real hero, and our villain is the non-optimal uh, data model size. As in most stories, heroes win in the end, so you will see how to overcome various challenges brought to us by the evil data model and resolve different issues uh, along this road and finally make your Power BI development a real fairy tale. So make yourself comfortable and take a seat, grab a coffee or some other refreshment, and let's start with our story. Uh, I guess you all know the story about Titanic. If you don't know, you should watch the movie with Kate Winslet and Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, we all watch it, so yeah, uh, uh, we all know the story about Titanic, but in short, Titanic uh, was the most powerful, most beautiful, most everything ship of all the time. But Titanic's story ended almost before it started. Uh, after only four days of uh, voyage from Southampton to New York City, uh, Titanic hardly hit one of the many icebergs in the Atlantic Ocean. And at first look, it didn't seem like something that can transform the greatest engineering achievement into a historical tragedy. Now you're probably asking yourselves what, what, this, uh, uh, what this story uh, about Titanic has with Power BI. But if we think a little deeper and we take a look at this nice looking uh, iceberg, we can think of Power BI as an iceberg in the cold ocean's waters. Uh, the tip of this iceberg is uh, your Power BI dashboard or the report itself. And doesn't that look beautiful, like a snowy mountain straight in the middle of this water? But the real thing is under the, the surface. The biggest and strongest part of this iceberg, which provides stability of this visible part. And this part underneath consists of multiple individual but cohesive parts which enable above the surface part to stand strong and shine. As I said, there are multiple individual portions down there. And if you think for a moment here as a Power BI developer, you will see different concepts, architectures and techniques that make your Power BI re uh, dashboard or report to shine. If you don't understand and apply those concepts on the right, such as data profiling, data modeling, and data shaping in a proper way, your Power BI report will experience, probably experience the same fate as Titanic. Uh, the same applies if you don't dedicate deserved attention to architectures and techniques on the left. Always keep in mind that all these, but also many more core concepts are uh, exactly what enable your Power BI dashboard to perform in the most optimal way. Therefore, never underestimate the importance of understanding all those invisible things under the surface. Uh, today, we will focus on learning and understanding the Vertipack engine and the way it stores the data. 
but you should also spend your time learning other key concepts uh, that I mentioned here. In the end, you can create Power BI reports that work without knowing, of course, those underlying concepts at all. But there is a huge difference between Power BI reports that just work and Power BI reports that work efficiently. OK, so now in order to follow the story or uh, watch the movie, you need to have some skills in advance. For example, you can't read book in Chinese if you don't know Chinese. So we are talking about prerequisites and in regard to this session prerequisites, I need to stress a few things. So this is, I would say, somewhere between 200 and 300 level session, uh, which means that uh, I will assume, assume that you have some, let's say, basic to intermediate knowledge and experience with Power BI and data modeling in general. That means I expect that you have at least basic understanding about relational databases, their structure in terms of how data is being stored in the database and to be able to, uh, of course, make a distinction between rows and columns. And of course, uh, understanding of Power BI and uh, is also necessary to follow along because I will often refer to some things that are related to Power BI development that I assume you are familiar with. So, as we agreed that I'm telling you a story, I mean, we didn't agree, but I hope you're fine with that. Uh, uh, I've intentionally avoided calling this part agenda. Instead, let's think of it as contents of the book. So what's in for you today? Uh, first, we will learn what is a VertiPack, uh, how it stores the data, what kind of algorithms VertiPack applies to compress the data, and how we can help as Power BI developers VertiPack to build an optimal data model for us. Uh, finally, we will need to leave our book on the shelf shortly, pick our toolboxes, go out, uh, get our hands dirty and dig deep under the hood of Power BI, uh, because during the demo I will show you a real life example uh, how I managed to reduce Power BI data model by a whopping 90% just by sticking with a few basic but extremely important rules. So we will talk about those rules today. OK, so here we are uh, once upon a time in a far, far away land. I'm just kidding. Of course, my story doesn't start like that. My story starts with a simple question to you. Have you ever wondered what makes Power BI so fast and powerful when it comes to performance? And when I say powerful, I mean that it's, uh, it is able to perform complex calculations over millions it, or even billions of rows in a blink of an eye. Maybe you wondered but couldn't find the proper answer. Perhaps you were just seeing the tip of this iceberg. So we will today discover what is under the surface. So going back to our starting point, what is a VertiPack? Uh, again, you will need to wait for an answer. Before we come to it, uh, I want to mark the line between row store versus columnar databases. Uh, VertiPack is a columnar database. As you can see in this illustration, columnar databases store and compress data in a whole different way compared to, to traditional row store databases. Uh, columnar databases are usually implemented in large analytical systems as they are optimized for vertical data scanning. This means that every column has its own structure and is physically separated from other columns. Other, another important distinction in order to understand what is VertiPack is to understand the difference between the formula engine and storage engine. Uh, as you may see in this illustration taken from the book Definitive Guide to DAX uh, from Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, uh, formula engine accepts your re request, processes the request, generates the query plan and finally executes that query. Uh, on the other side, storage engine pulls the data out of the tabular model to satisfy this request issued within the query generated by the formula engine. Storage engine can work in two different modes in order to retrieve requested data. Uh, first one is. Uh, sorry, so first one is VertiPack, this part here which basically keeps the snapshot of your data in memory. And this data snapshot can be refreshed from time to time from the original data source. As I said today, this part of architecture will be our main focus. We will also talk shortly about uh, Direct Query. Direct Query doesn't store any data. 
it just forwards the query straight to the data source for every single request. OK, so let's first talk about Formula Engine. Formula Engine represents the brain of Power BI. And as I already mentioned, Formula Engine accepts the query. And since it's able to understand DEX and MDX, by the way, but it is out of the scope of this session, uh, Formula Engine translates DEX into a specific query plan, uh, which consists of various physical operations that need to be executed in order to get our results back. Uh, those physical operations can be joins between multiple tables, uh, filtering, aggregations, and so on. It's important to keep in mind that Formula Engine works in a single-threaded way, which means that requests to Storage Engine are always being sent in sequence. So let's return once more through the whole process that is happening within the Formula Engine. The first step is that Formula Engine accepts the request. Then it will process your request. Next is generating the query plan, and finally, it executes the generated query. Once the query has been generated and executed by the formula engine, storage engine comes uh, into the scene. So since it physically goes, literally physically goes through the data stored within the tabular model, which is VertiPack, or goes directly to a different data source like SQL Server, for example, if you're using direct query, we can think of storage engine as the muscles of Power BI. When it comes to specifying the storage engine for the table, there are three possible options to choose from. Uh, those three options are import mode, direct query mode, and dual mode. Uh, as opposed to formal engine that doesn't support parallelism, uh, storage engine can work asynchronously. So let's briefly first introduce import mode, which is the most common way to store the data when working with Power BI. Uh, that being said, import mode is based on uh, worthy pack and the uh, table data is being stored in memory, so in cache memory as a snapshot. And then uh, you can refresh uh, you can refresh this data snapshot from time to time, depending on your business needs. It can be once per day, once per hour, once per month, and so on. When you're using direct query storage mode, data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. Uh, that brings us to an important conclusion that data lives in its original source before, during, and after the query execution. So nothing goes into Power BI itself. Finally, dual mode represents a combination of previous two uh, options of import mode and direct query. That means that data from the table is being loaded into the memory, like we, we are we having uh, uh, the case with import mode. But at the query time, depending on your setup uh, within the data model, it can be also retrieved directly from the data source. OK, as you have drawn a big picture previously, let me explain in more detail what VertiPack does in the background to boost the performance of our Power BI reports. Uh, when we choose import mode for our Power BI tables, uh, VertiPack will perform the following actions. First, it will read the data source and transform all of the data into a columnar structure. Then after that, it will encode uh, and compress the data within each of these columns. Next step is to establish dictionary and index for each of the columns. I'll explain uh, in a few minutes what that means. Uh, after that, it will prepare and establish relationships. And finally, it will compute all calculated columns and calculated tables and compress them. This one is important. How Vertipex stores the data? Uh, as you may recall from the previous part of our talk, uh, two main characteristics of Vertipex are that uh, Vertipex is a columnar database and Vertipex is an in-memory database. So Vertipex is a columnar in-memory database. Uh, Vertipex applies different types of compression to each of the columns independently, choosing the optimal compression algorithm based on the values in that specific column. Uh, compression within the VertiPack is being achieved by encoding the values within the column. But before we dive deeper into a detailed overview of various encoding techniques, just keep in mind that this architecture is not exclusively related to Power BI. Uh, in the background is a tabular model, which also uh, 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 works under the hood of 
Analysis Services Tabular and Excel Power Pivot. So let's examine different encoding types uh, which Vertipack applies in order to compress our data. Those are uh, there are three of them, or let's say two main and one that is like a subtype. Uh, those those encoding types are value encoding, hash encoding, or dictionary encoding, and run length encoding or uh, RLE abbreviated. Now we will go into more details regarding each of these encoding types. Uh, value encoding is the most desirable uh, encoding type since it works exclusively with integers. Uh, because of that, it requires less memory than, for example, when you're working with text values. How does this look in reality? Uh, let's say we have a column containing a number of phone calls per day. Uh, and the value in this columns, uh, column goes from 4000 to 5000. What the Vertipak will do here is to find the minimum value in this range, which is 4000, and set this value as a starting point. Then it will calculate the difference between this value and all the other values in the column, storing this difference as a new value. You may think, OK, in this case, we save three bits per one row, which is nothing, nothing, you know, three bits is nothing. But let's say that this table has 500 million rows and then multiply this with three bits per row. I think you will then start to appreciate the amount of memory save. Uh, by using value encoding. Hash encoding is probably the most commonly used uh, compression type by Vertipack. Uh, by using hash encoding, Vertipack creates a dictionary of distinct values within one column and afterward replaces real values with index values from that dictionary. Sounds confusing, I admit, but, but yeah, uh, let me show you an example how this looks like. It's much easier to understand. So here, uh, as you may notice, Vertipack identified distinct values within the subject column, built a dictionary by assigning indexes to those values, and finally stored index values as pointers to real values. I assume you are aware that uh, integer values require way less memory space than text, so that's the logic behind uh, this type of compression. Uh, in addition, by being able to build a dictionary for literally any data type, uh, Vertipack is practically data type independent, uh, and this brings us to another key takeaway. No matter if your column is of text, big integer, flow data type, from Vertipack perspective, it's all the same. Uh, Vertipack will create a dictionary for each of those columns, which implies that all these columns will provide exactly the same performance, both in terms of speed and memory space allocated. Of course, by assuming that there is no big difference between dictionary size between those columns. So, uh, as I said, it's a myth that the data type of the column affects its size within the data model. It affects only the dictionary size. Uh, on the other hand, number of distinct values within the column, which is known as cardinality, mostly influence column memory consumption, as you will see in the demo in a few minutes. Finally, third algorithm, uh, run length encoding, creates a kind of a mapping table containing ranges of repeating values and uh, that way avoiding to store every single repeated value separately. Again, let's take a look at the example and uh, this will help you to better understand this concept. So you see that, for example, subject complaint starts at position one and we have uh, four repeating values of complaint. Then new contract starts and a uh, number of, OK, I made a mistake here. So uh, bonus minutes start at eight, the uh, termination and so on, but you get the point. Uh, in real life, Vertipack doesn't store these uh, start values. This is here just for the illustration purpose because it can quickly calculate where the next node begins just by simply summing uh, previous count values. But as powerful as it might look at first glance, uh, run length encoding algorithm is highly dependent on the ordering within the column. So if your data is stored the way you see in this example, when you have uh, a lot of buckets with repeating values, uh, like here, 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 uh, in those situations, our run length encoding will perform great. However, if your data buckets are smaller and rotating more frequently, then run length encoding would not be an optimal solution. And one more thing to keep in mind, in uh, keep in mind regarding run length encoding. In reality, uh, Vertipack doesn't apply run length encoding on its own. So first, 
uh, vertipec apply hash encoding uh, and then depending on the sorting order within your column vertipec can decide to apply run length encoding on top of it so as an additional uh, compression uh, 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 technique to optimize uh, the data model size. So run length encoding occurs after hash encoding in those scenarios when Vertipec thinks that it makes sense to compress data additionally. OK, so let's just briefly iterate through the process of data compression for a specific column. Now imagine you have a table with many columns and this is what happens once you want to import data into Power BI. This is what happens on a single column level. So first of all, Vertipec will scan a sample of rows from the column. And if the column data type is not an integer, it will look no further and it will use hash encoding. So for all non-integer columns, it will be hash encoding. If it's integer data type, then some additional evaluations are being taken into account. Uh, if the numbers in this sample linearly increase, Vertipec is smart enough to uh, conclude that this is probably a primary key and it will choose a value encoding. Uh, if the numbers in this column, so we are talking now about value range, it, we, we are not talking about key columns. Now, if you have value range like we had uh, with this phone calls example, uh, if the numbers are reasonably close to each other, like in our example with phone calls between 4,000 and 5,000, uh, Vertipec will use value encoding. On the other side, when values fluctuate significantly within this range, let's say that you have values between 1,000 and 1 million, then value encoding uh, doesn't make sense and Vertipec will apply the hash algorithm instead. However, uh, no matter how smart Vertipec is, it can also make some bad decisions which are based on incorrect assumptions uh, made uh, by looking at this sample. Therefore, sometimes it can happen that Vertipec makes a decision about which algorithm to use based on the sample data, but then uh, some outlier pops up and uh, Vertipec needs to re-encode the column from the scratch. Let's use again our previous example for the number of phone calls. And let's say that Vertipec scans the sample and saw values between 4,000 and 5,000 and decided to apply value encoding. Then after processing, let's say 10 million rows, all of a sudden it found a 500,000 value. It can be an error or, or whatever. Now Vertipec will reevaluate uh, uh, the choice and it can decide to re-encode the whole column from scratch using the hash algorithm instead. And surely that would impact the whole process in terms of the time needed for reprocessing. So here is the list of parameters in order of their importance that Vertipec considers when choosing which algorithm to use. Uh, first one is number of distinct values in the column, which is known as cardinality. Then data distribution within the column. Uh, that means column with many repeating values can be better compressed than one containing frequently changing values. Because as you already learned, uh, run length encoding algorithm can be applied on the top to additionally compress the data. Uh, next one, number of rows in the table and finally, column data type, which, as I said, impacts only dictionary size. The next very important thing to understand when uh, reducing data model size is uh, relationships. Uh, once the DAX query has been generated by the formula engine, uh, then storage engine enters the stage and starts its physical work to satisfy the request. And relationships play a big part in this process. Uh, because they enable quicker transfer of the filter context between related tables. The most important thing to keep in mind regarding relationships is uh, the higher the cardinality of the column that makes part of the relationship, the higher the cost of that relationship is. Uh, it's usually said that when the cardinality of the relationship exceeds 1 million, users can notice slower performance in the report. So if you identify relationships within your data model that have cardinality above this threshold, maybe you should start thinking of possible ways to optimize this. Uh, one of reasonable solutions could be creating pre-aggregated tables with different levels of granularity so you avoid expensive relationships at the query time. Aggregations also very important concepts for reducing data model size and they are nothing more than 
reorganized versions of your source table. So you can have multiple different tables related to the same original table. Why are we creating aggregations? Uh, yeah, basically by pre-aggregating data on different levels of granularity, we can help the storage engine to work faster and scan the data in a more efficient way. Uh, by applying different aggregations, in the end, we are reducing the amount of data, basically reducing the amount of uh, the number of rows and columns. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, my raw table contains 7,346 records for uh, chats between 9th of July 2017 and 10th of July. Now, if I pre-aggregate uh, data and count number of chats per specific subject, my aggregated table will have only 45 rows. So if my users need to analyze data per date and or chat subject, having this kind of prepared table will make the storage engine's job much easier and it can retrieve the data much faster because instead of scanning 7,000 rows, it will scan just 45 rows. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind regarding uh, aggregations, they don't have any impact on the optimization of the complex DEX calculations. So they're just enabling the storage engine to work more efficiently and reduce the time needed to execute the queries. Uh, uh, again, aggregations work only with native columns from your data model. In other words, you can't perform aggregations on uh, calculated columns. To be honest, uh, aggregations are not always the way to go. Be careful when creating them, them as each mistake can prove costly in the end, because if not defined in a proper way, aggregations can produce incorrect results in the report. So if your data model, uh, data model size is not so large, maybe you don't need uh, uh, aggregation. Think about this. OK, I believe you laid a solid theoretical background for the things that come now. And sorry if it took a little bit longer for this uh, uh, theoretical part. I promised we are now uh, moving to Power BI Desktop and will not leave it anymore until the end of uh, our session. So it's time to get our hands dirty and see how all of this uh, works in reality. First of all, let me drink a little bit of water. Uh, this demo is based on a real use case, uh, which I faced two years ago. Uh, the problem was with the size of PBIX file on the reporting server. And file size has dramatically grown since the report had been first introduced. So I was involved in trying to find a solution and optimize this uh, uh, somehow. And I just want to stress one thing before we proceed further. Uh, for this demo, I've created four separate PBIX files, each of them representing one single stage in the data model size optimization. I did that simply because we don't need to work on one single file and wait for Power BI to apply uh, all changes we made during the process. Uh, because, you know, in some cases it takes a while to uh, reload the data and recreate the data model. So let's start uh, with the first one, not the Windows Store. That's not the plan. OK, so this is my starting point. Uh, this is, let me show you data model quickly. So it's quite simple data model. I have one fact table and two dimension tables. Uh, fact table contains data about chats performed by uh, customer support department, and I left only two uh, Two dimension tables here. In reality, there were more, but uh, for the sake of this demo, let's focus on optimizing our fact table. And let me show you here. If I go to my fact table, you see that it has around 9.3 million rows. So it's nothing special in terms of volume. 9.3 million rows. I mean, Power BI uh, should be able to cope with that without any problems. And I put just a simple card visual here. So uh, as we are moving uh, uh, from one solution to other, you see that uh, our report correctness is not being violated by applying different optimization techniques. So just to follow that, we have the same number of rows uh, displayed here. OK, so to be able to follow what is going on with our data model size, <coughs> I will use DAX Studio. I sincerely hope that you are all familiar with this external tool. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, DEX Studio is a fantastic free tool created by Darren Gosbell, a uh, guy from Australia, and it has a whole bunch of very handy and useful features 
that I think we will need uh, a separate 60 minute session just to talk about them. Uh, in any case, if you're working with Power BI uh, on a day to day basis, you should definitely start using Deck Studio. Believe me, it will make your life much easier. Uh, with that in mind, one of my favorite features within Deck Studio is Vertipack Analyzer tool that will help us to see the numbers behind our data model. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Vertipack Analyzer, uh, what Vertipack Analyzer does basically is it just collects data from various dynamic management views. So basically, if you don't have uh, access to Deck Studio for whatever reason in your company, you can also use uh, other client tools like SQL Server Management Studio or Azure Data Studio to query to directly query dynamic management views and get data about your data model. But as I said, you will probably find it in much more uh, uh, convenient form within Vertipack Analyzer. So I will launch Deck Studio directly from Power BI desktop. It will now connect to my data model. And on the left hand side, I see all of my tables here. OK, so now let's go to uh, on the top to advanced tab and under advanced tab, there is this view metrics uh, button, which I will click and this will launch Vertipack Analyzer statistics. Let me show you quickly what do we have here. So we have all of our tables. We have uh, this cardinality column means a uh, number of distinct values in the column, but on a table level, that means the number of rows in the table. You see that this number matches with the one I shown you in Power BI desktop previously. We have table size, uh, data size, dictionary size, and so on. Uh, all those numbers are in bytes, uh, which means that, for example, our fact chat table is almost two, two gigabytes large. You can also see uh, in terms of in percentage uh, how much space each of the table consume in our uh, data model. But if I click on this small arrow next to a table name, I'll be able to see all those numbers broken down on a column level. And I can immediately spot that most expensive columns in our case are date team start, date team start, UTC, source ID, and so on and so on. So those first three columns, they, let's say four columns, take approximately 1.5 gigabytes. You can see the whole data model size if you click on summary. And please remember this number, 1.86 gigabytes. That's the total size of our data model. So I want you to remember this number, 1.86 gigabytes. And that really hurts. And we haven't even interacted with the report. So let's see what we can do to optimize uh, our data model. As I said, if we go to tables, uh, I can see that uh, which are the most expensive columns in my table. Date team start, date team start, UTC, source ID, session referer, and so on. So let's go and First of all, this source ID column. Let me explain what this column means uh, uh, in terms from business perspective, so you get a better understanding why we are doing some steps that we we are going to do soon. Uh, date team start uh, is the time uh, when the chat started in a local time zone, and uh, this uh, data is being imported as as it is. So uh, with date time data type, go, meaning going to a second or let's say millisecond level of precision, but second level of precision. Day team start UTC is just this value converted to UTC. Then we have source ID, which is the unique key from the source system and so on and so on. So let's go and remove for the beginning. Let's remove just this source ID column because I already have uh, here. I have chat ID column, which is uh, the, the surrogate key from data warehouse. So basically that's primary key uh, of uh, this table. So I'll go back to my Power BI desktop and let's go to Power Query Editor. Fact chat and I'll remove uh, source ID column. Source ID, source ID, here it is. So I'll just remove this column and hit close and apply. Let's wait for a few moments for Power BI to apply those changes. It was fast. 
Now let's go back to Deck Studio and refresh this view. Go to summary. So it's not 1.54 megabytes. So by moving just one, just one unnecessary column, we saved more than 300 megabytes. So let's examine further what can be removed without taking a deeper look. And we will come later into a deeper look, I promise. As I said, do we need, do we really need both the original start time and UTC time? Both start as date time, so both going to a second level of precision. So let me get rid of the original start time column and keep only UTC values. In any case, it's easy to uh, to do some uh, calculations and uh, move from UTC to another time zone directly in Power BI. Uh, also, session referer and referer columns. Let me show you. Those are just a bunch of uh, some uh, uh, JSON strings imported as it is in Power BI. So let me show you. And here you see what I was talking about. We have date and we have time portion here for session referer and referer. Uh, let me find it. Mm, user time zone, wait time, wait time, let's take it. Probably I can't find it here. Never mind. So let's go back to Power Query Editor. And let's get rid of those columns that we don't need. So I will go to my fact chat. I will remove uh, date TM start. Then I will remove. Uh, here is the referer and session referer. Then what else do we need? Do, we don't need is, for example, uh, last edit date, which is basically the date when the record was last time updated in. Uh, our data warehouse, and finally chat variables. Also, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, JSON records imported as it is from the original data source. So I'll remove those columns, and then again hit close and apply. And let's wait for Power BI to apply those changes. That was fast. Again, refresh view metrics, and now if I go to summary, you will see that my data model size is now. 658 megabytes, 658 megabytes. So we basically shrank two thirds the size of our data model just by removing few unnecessary columns. So we didn't do anything really in terms of optimizing columns itself. We just remove unnecessary columns. And uh, the first takeaway from this session, check which columns are unnecessary and unused in your reports. And that should always be your starting point when you are troubleshooting uh, data model size optimization. Why? Uh, let me show you an example. I want to show you an example. It's it's more co convincing. Let's imagine that you are preparing a delicious dinner for your friends. Uh, you invited them for a tasty pizza, but before you make this dish, you have to prepare the ingredients. So what goes into a regular pizza? Uh, let's say pizza bread, of course, tomato sauce, ham, cheese, Maybe you need some extra ingredients for some of your guests, such as, I don't know, pineapple, corn, egg, olives, because you are a good host and you want to satisfy all your guests' needs. So what is the next step? Uh, you are going to local shop to buy all you need for your perfect pizza. But while you are walking through the shelves in the shop, you see a beer. Do you need a beer for pizza? I mean, it's always nice to have a beer, but do you need it to make your pizza? A uh, few steps more and you spot a chocolate ice cream. Mm, I like chocolate ice cream. I really do. But again, do I need it for my pizza? I mean, that would be really weird pizza with chocolate ice cream on it. So what is the moral of this pizza story? You should focus on those and only those things you really need. Translate it to your Power BI development. You should focus only on data that your report users really need. OK, you can put something extra such as pineapples uh, uh, or something like this in some circumstances when you think that it would bring additional business value to your report or dashboard, but carefully evaluate if that brings more benefit in the final outcome. Uh, would you buy a whole pineapple and put it all over your big pizza if you have only one guest that eats uh, pizza with pineapple and let's say five others that don't like this taste? Or should you maybe prepare smaller pizza for this one guest that likes pineapple without disrupting the main pizza? 
I believe that it's always useful to keep in mind this uh, uh, pizza analogy when you are considering which data to put uh, in your data model. OK, going back to DAX Studio and uh, here, true to be said, uh, there are a few more columns that could be dismissed from data model, but let's now focus on other techniques for data model optimization. As you may recall from the previous part of, of this talk, uh, when I was emphasizing the order of importance of parameters that affect the model size, I mentioned that cardinality is number one. So cardinality is number of distinct values within the column. Uh, the rule of thumb is the, the, the higher the cardinality of the column, so the more distinct values in it, it will be harder for Vertipack to optimally compress the data, especially if we are not working with integer values. Uh, there are multiple techniques for reducing the column cardinality, and the most popular one is column splitting. So I'll share with you now uh, a few examples of using this technique. Um, basically, optimization techniques must be performed on the source side, in most, most cases by writing a T-SQL statement or within the Power Query Editor. Uh, of course, if you're writing custom T-SQL codes to import data to your Power BI data model, Keep in mind that you should perform all necessary transformations then in your T-SQL logic as uh, the query folding would be broken if you use custom T-SQL and afterward apply additional transformation steps in Power Query Editor. So let me show you how you can use car different cardinality reduction techniques to uh, split the columns. So in this case, instead of having one column with 10 distinct values, I created two columns using uh, division and model operations. Uh, two columns, this one has cardinality of one, and this one again has cardinality of 10, but uh, we saved some bits per one single row. Example from the beginning of uh, the session. Then if you have decimal values, for example, what you can do is you can split uh, your column to contain values before and after the decimal point. In this case, instead of having uh, uh, a highly high cardinal column, you have two columns with uh, lower cardinality. And finally, this one is probably the most uh, often used uh, 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 technique. If you have a date time column and you need to keep both date and time portion for reporting purposes, uh, you can split uh, date portion in one column and time portion in another column. This way, here instead of having 10 distinct values, I have just, I don't know, one, two, three. And here, uh, yeah, the maximum cardinality of this column would be uh, the number of seconds within 24 hours, which is 86,000 uh, and something. So basically, this way, uh, for extremely large models, you can achieve uh, uh, significant memory, memory savings. So th those were techniques uh, for optimizing uh, for uh, reducing the cardinality. Of course, keep in mind that these techniques would require additional effort in the rep uh, report itself because you will need to rewrite your measures to return correct results. So be careful when to use them. Uh, we will examine this in the closing part of the session. I just want you to be aware that these techniques exist and can bring significant benefits in specific scenarios. Uh, so since we don't have any decimal values in our example, let's focus on our exact problem here. Let me show you. And this is date team start column, uh, date team start UTC column, which has cardinality of almost 9 million and it consumes almost half of gigabytes, so 454 megabytes. Okay, so in 95% of cases, day level uh, of granularity is completely fine for all analytic reports. So your users usually will need to analyze data on a day level. Uh, so what I did here, and I made a mistake, I will tell you why. So I'll, uh, not this one, uh, this one. Okay, so what I did here, let me show you. So I just changed the type of my date team star UTC column. So I just changed the type from date time to date. So you see there is no time portion anymore. And uh, let me just turn off this. Uh, and uh, so now we have only dates. Fine. Hit close and apply. And let me open a new uh, DAX Studio instance to 
show you what's what's happening now. OK, go to advanced view metrics and now you see if I go to summary, it's just 212 megabytes, 212 megabytes. So approximately 15% from what we started from. And uh, Vertipack Analyzer, if we go to check this column, date team start UTC, it's here. So you see that instead of 454 megabytes, it just takes nine megabytes now. And we have instead of nine, almost nine million distinct values, you have just slightly more than 1000. And that's huge. However, the, the mistake I made is that I didn't ask my users if they're fine enough to have data on a daily level. It appeared that day level grain was not fine and my users needed to analyze figures on our level. So they can decide how many agents to assign for uh, morning shifts, uh, evening shifts and so on. So I thought at least we can get rid of minutes and seconds and that would also decrease uh, the cardinality of this column. So what I did, I imported values around it per hour. Let me show you uh, here. I will go to uh, transform data. And in this case, I wrote a T SQL query. That basically let me show you, maybe it's easier to, to understand here. So what I did here, I create uh, I rounded chat time to a starting hour. That was the request from my users. So what happened here? Uh, all chats that starts between 30000 and 35959 basically will be rounded to a starting hour, which is 30000. And that brings us to this. Instead of having 10 distinct values, so this is one, two, three, four, 10 distinct values, I have only one. So I applied this technique in Power BI Desktop. Uh, this, is the, this is the SQL query. Close and apply and Let's check this solution. So in this case, we had 212 megabytes. Now, if I open uh, from this uh, hour, so let's go and open another instance of Dex Studio. Go to advanced and open view metrics. Let's go to summary. It's 221. So it's 10 megabytes more, but it's nothing compared to uh, uh, 700 megabytes or, or 1.8. Uh, uh, gigabytes. So basically, if I now check my date team start UTC column, here it is. Okay, so now instead of uh, having uh, nine megabytes, it's 19 megabytes, and we have 32,000 distinct values instead of uh, uh, 1,000, but it's still way better than having nine million distinct values and having a column size of 450 megabytes. It's still it's still good and Basically, we satisfy the business request and we significantly reduce uh, the data size column. However, one thing still bothered me here. Uh, this chat ID column here uh, that takes around one, one third of my table, of the whole table. And this is just a surrogate key. Uh, this column, of course, has a cardinality that matches the number of rows of the table. Uh, however, this column is not used in any of the relationships within my data model, not in the calculations anywhere. Uh, just to be clear, and I don't want you to come to, to jump to some quick and incorrect assumptions. Uh, you can't simply remove all columns, ID columns like this one, IP address ID, customer ID, user ID, product ID. Why? Because those columns are being used uh, uh, as foreign keys to our dimension tables, and therefore they are part of the relationships in our data model. So if the column is part of the relationship, you can't simply remove it because uh, your report will not, I mean, it will work, but uh, not, in, in, not in a proper way. But the chat ID column, as I said, is just a surrogate key, so it doesn't have any business meaning. It's not part of the relationship. It's not being used in calculations. So I asked myself, if there would be any benefit if I uh, keep this chat ID column and all since it's not being used. And uh, finally, I removed uh, chat ID column from the table. This is the solution without chat ID column. Uh, let's again open uh, Deck Studio and see our final result. So I'm going to advanced view metrics summary. 160 megabytes. 
that's astonishing. So I didn't lie to you when I said that I managed to reduce my data model size by 90%. And if you compare our starting point, which was 1.86 gigabytes, I think, with the current 160 megabytes, I will let you do the math. And one last step uh, was to disable auto date time options, uh, auto date timing options for data loading. If you are not aware, uh, when you leave auto date time option checked, it will create a hidden date table for every single date field in your data model. So if you have multiple date fields uh, uh, in a table of hundreds of millions or even billions of rows, your data model will, will be bloated with those hidden date tables. What's even worse, uh, these tables will search for the minimum and maximum date value in that column and create a date range between minimum and maximum value. So if it happens that you have something like uh, December 31st, uh, 2099 for the current records, your automatically created date table will span until that date. Uh, of course, working with dates and importance of having a proper date dimension uh, to handle all your time intelligence calculations uh, should be a topic for separate session, but I just wanted to give you a quick heads up why you should consider disabling all today time for your Power BI desktop files. Uh, and here is another very handy use case of DAX Studio. You can't see these hidden date tables anywhere in Power BI desktop, but once you connect uh, your data model uh, with DAX Studio, you can see them. So all these tables with these funny names like local date table, blah, 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 local date table with some uh, 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 hexadecimal characters after the, the, their uh, name. Those are all hidden date tables automatically created by Power BI. So if I go to uh, here and go to options and settings, options and data load, I will turn off auto date time. OK, and now if we go back to DAX Studio, you see that those uh, tables disappeared uh, from the left. And if I again click on view metrics and summary, OK, this brought additional four megabytes of savings. Not bad, uh, uh, but to conclude, I managed to reduce my data model size by almost 90%. As you saw, applying some really simple techniques which enable the Vertipack storage engine to perform more optimal compression of the data or by simply uh, removing unnecessary columns. And as I said, this was a real use case which I faced uh, two years ago. So you were just like watching like a documentary about my uh, Power BI work. OK, now some of you may think, wait, Nicola, why did you waste our uh, time with this blah, blah, boring talk about VertiPack and coding types, cardinality? What you have just shown us is basically just removal of unnecessary columns, nothing special. And I have to admit you are not completely, but almost completely right. Uh, but in 95% of cases, when you are performing data model size optimization, simple removal of unnecessary and unused columns will be enough to get your job done, believe me. And as I already mentioned, but it's never uh, enough repeating this, that should be your starting point when you're dealing with data model size optimization. In the remaining 5% of scenarios, you would maybe need to uh, apply some more advanced approaches such as uh, cardinality reduction and using some of the uh, techniques I've shown you a few minutes ago. OK, to slowly conclude, uh, here is the list of general rules you should keep in mind when trying to reduce the data model size. First, again, Keep only those columns your users need in the report. Just sticking with this one single rule will save you an unbelievable amount of space, I assure you. Uh, as you've just seen in our demo, sticking with this one rule helped us to make astonishing savings. Always remember the pizza comparison. Next one, uh, try to optimize column cardinality whenever possible. Here, as probably everywhere else, the golden rule is to test, test, and test. And if there is a significant benefit from, for example, splitting one column into two columns or substituting decimal values uh, uh, with uh, two whole number columns, then do it. But also be ready to, uh, uh, to keep in mind that your measures need to be rewritten to handle those structural changes. So if your table is not so big, or if you have to rewrite, I don't know, hundreds of measures, maybe it's not worth splitting the column. As I said, it depends on your specific scenario and you should carefully evaluate 
which solution makes more sense. Uh, same as for columns, keep only those rows you need. For example, maybe you don't need to import data from the last 10 years, but only five. That will also reduce your data model size. Uh, talk to your users and ask them what they really need before blindly uh, uh, putting everything inside your data model. Aggregate your data whenever possible. That means fewer rows, lower cardinality, so all these nice things that uh, we are trying to achieve. If you don't need hours, minutes, or seconds level of granularity, don't import them. Uh, aggregations in Power BI have, are a very important and wide topic, uh, which is out of the scope of this session, but there are some really awesome resources on the web, and I strongly recommend you uh, to read the blog series on creative aggregations from Phil Simark at uh, dex.tips. Avoid using calculated columns whenever possible. Uh, simply said, they're not optimally compressed. Uh, instead, if you need to do some calculations, try to push them to a data source like SQL Server, for example, or perform them uh, using Power Query Editor. Finally, use proper data types. Uh, for example, if your data granularity is on a day level, there is really no need to use date time data type for uh, these columns. In those circumstances, plain date data type will be completely fine. And finally, disable all to date time option for data loading, as this will remove a bunch of automatically created date tables in the background. Uh, that was it for my side. Looking forward to hearing your questions. And in case that we don't have enough time to answer all of them, or if I don't know the answer right now, I'll try to collect the questions and get back with the answers either through my blog or some other way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. That was a great session. I learned a lot about the, how to reduce the size from 1.8 gigabyte to 156. Wow, that was yeah. amazing. I thought with that speed, you will reduce the size to one byte. So din, 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 din. But 91.61% reduced. Amazing. Yeah, that, that was so, a real use case, really. That, that was that happened yeah, two years ago. Yeah. And it's not only not only the good important for in terms of the performance, when it comes to the size, it's very important because we are limited based on all license and workspace when we want to publish it on Power BI service. So it's very important performance, size. And at the end, the cost we need to pay for the different license, very important things. So uh, just uh, for for the people on this chat, I can see two people raise their hand. So Bahar, if you want to ask your question, turn on your mic and ask your question. Yep. Hey. Um, hey, Nicola. Thank you so Hi. much. That was a great session. Thank uh, you. I learned a lot, as Vahid mentioned. Um, yeah. My question is um, about the, like the. I guess that's a regular question about the the RAM memory that needed for a device when we're using Power BI. So um, because I currently working with Power BI and always getting um, uh, an error for um, you know limited memory and always I needed to close it and then open it again. So that's so. What is the preferred um, you know RAM memory? Do you think that's hard to answer? There 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 is no answer like uh, this number is proper. It depends on your workload, but from my experience, I would say anything below 16 gigabytes of RAM locally. So if, if you're using a machine uh, with low, uh, less than 16 gigabytes of RAM, you can run into trouble. Doesn't mean that yeah. you will necessarily mm -hmm. do, but you can. The, the more, the better. So yeah, yeah I would true. say Mine something is, 16 or yeah. 30, 32 if possible, that's yeah, I would I um I thought so because mine is 16, but there's still I got lots of that's because I'm I guess um I'm um working with the big data. So but um actually um your data sources from the for the fact table, it was just um uh, including nine million recorded more, but it was it was very quick to be updated and then you know you 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 did some changes in um Power Query, but it was so quick, you know, to save it and go to, uh, you know, <laughs> using it in the report. But for me, when I'm just doing that, it just takes for ages. Like, yeah. 
Uh, what was the source? What was the data source that you used? So uh, like SQL, it's SQL mean? Server. It's SQL Server, but my machine is quite powerful here that I'm using. Yeah, that was just like curious about that. Yeah, yeah. okay, thank you so it can, much. It can take a while. It can take a while, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the better machine, the faster it will work. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Nick. No problem. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. So I can see Sean has this another question. So Sean, feel free to turn on your mic. Uh, hello. Well, we yes. can hear you. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Nicola, for your great presentation. You're welcome. Uh, I just have a question uh, about uh, when you talked about the hash coding uh, and uh, trans uh, changing the distinct text values into the uh, in indexes. Uh, I, I don't know if I got it correctly or not. Should we do it in the background in the, uh, in, the uh, in our database and then uh, when, when we want to create a uh, data set or? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good question. So yeah, I didn't explain this during the session. So this is automatically applied by Vertipack. So you don't need to do anything. Uh, Vertipack uh, scans your data and Vertipack decides what type of algorithm uh, will be applied for a certain column. There is a way to change this, but I don't recommend doing so. You can do this in tabular editor. The, there, are, there is a, a thing called query hint where you explicitly uh, instruct Vertipack that you want to use value encoding, for example, instead of hash encoding. That can be done explicitly, but I don't recommend doing this for multiple reasons. Uh, in other cases, you don't need to do anything. So Vertipack will apply uh, uh, the algorithm on its own. So it, it will decide which is the, the most proper algorithm for your column. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sean, Sorry, we I... can't hear you. Yeah. Your video freeze. freezed. Yeah. Yep. 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 Hello? Ah, you're back. OK. Yeah. It's good now. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, the problem arises when, uh, because when uh, you, you use the import query, but when we are uh, using the direct query, because I think that this calculation and changing uh, the text values into the indexes, it takes a little bit time maybe. And uh, when uh, we want to press uh, any filter, any slicers, any buttons or drill down uh, options, it also, I think, adds uh, some uh, extra time to do this calculation and change into indexes and uh, is it useful to use uh, so this if you're method talking for about, the If you're talking direct query, uh, uh, those algorithms, uh, they, are, they are completely irrelevant because this, is, this applies only to Vertipack when Vertipack stores the data within its memory. So when you use import mode, uh, when you use direct query mode, uh, it doesn't matter. Then it depends on different things, mostly on the performance of your source system, of your source database. But then those algorithms uh, are not uh, uh, are not in the scope anymore. So it it doesn't matter uh, uh, if it's value uh, value encoding or hash encoding. When you're using direct query, uh, those algorithms are not uh, are not applied. Thank you so much. No problem. You're welcome. Thank you. So I can see Suwi raised uh, its hand. So Suwi, feel free to turn on your mic and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Nicola. It was really a great session. For the, Thank you. I learned really a lot. I understood how the water pack and all those things work. But that was a great session. The thing I really want to ask is I'm currently working on a mod on a PBI file, which has various um, I should say pages and had loads of uh, visualizations. So, so, for example, table. And in that table, I have various measures such as um, month over variance and all these things. So, what my what I'm facing right now is as I'm adding more and more visualization in my Power BI model, it is really getting slower and slower. And uh, when I try to analyze through DAX Studio. I haven't found any of the issues with the my DAX codes because that's what I uh, I try to do. But uh, but I do have various data data column date columns I should say where 
and those date columns I need to have in my data model because that is required by the uh, client. Now, if I want to uh, really enhance the performance of my of my particular this particular Power BI file, what can be the other scenarios where I can, uh, which can help me to reduce the size of this particular file and enhance the performance? Yeah. Uh, so if the DAX is not a problem, if you confirm the DAX is not a problem, and yeah. uh, you face problems because you have too many visuals on the report page. Yeah. Then you need to reduce the number of visuals. I, I know it sounds uh, <laughs> simple and trivial, but uh, I know it's not. But what uh, what is the problem when you have too many visuals on the report page? Problem mm -hmm. is that uh, maybe you recall from the beginning of, of our talk today that Formula Engine works in a single threaded way. So let's say mm -hmm. that you have that you have 20 visuals on the page, mm -hmm. and you have DAX query that populates each of these 20 visuals. Mm -hmm. So what happens? Let's say that your DAX is optimized. Your measures are really simple, nothing complex. So they, yeah. they let's say the DAX executes in 20 milliseconds, for example, for each visual. But what mm -hmm. happens? Because Formula Engine works in a single threaded way. It can generate one DAX query at a time, which means it will generate DAX query for the first visual, then for the second visual, then for the third visual, and so on. So the 20th visual in this queue will need mm -hmm. to wait for previous 19 to complete. And when you multiply 19 with, I don't know, 20 milliseconds, it's 400 mm -hmm. milliseconds, so it's half a second. I gave you just a trivial example. Maybe it takes more, but uh, the problem is if you have too many visuals, there are too many DAX queries, and the last one in this queue will need to wait for all the others to complete. Formula Engine mm -hmm. cannot work uh, uh, cannot work in parallel, so it can't uh, create 20 DAX queries at a time. It's not possible. So just well, I would like to ask you one question when I'm talking to my client regarding the their requirements, how should we need to negotiate or trade off between the number of visuals and uh, number of measure? Uh, I guess you're getting what I'm trying to ask you yeah, because yeah. if the client is asking the certain kind of a dashboard and then we have to fulfill those requirements and in the in the process of fulfilling those requirements, we need to get uh, all these thing kind of you know visualization the the one you were saying. So yeah, it's that, a trade off. I would doing. say it's a trade off. Yeah, you you can either create a, uh, another page. So instead of having I don't know one page with thirty visuals, you create three pages with ten visuals. That okay. that that can help. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a trade off. So between performance and uh, having everything in one place. Yeah, getting your point, Nicola. Thank you very much. I'll no try problem. to get out. Thanks a lot. It was nice to have a have you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is one question in the chat box. Uh, say the if I uh -huh. pronounce I your see. name wrong uh -huh. incorrectly, please. Uh, if there are too many measures, would using calculation groups helps in improving performance? Uh, in terms of performance itself, no. Uh, but in terms of uh, having simpler data model and uh, more readable, uh, it will help definitely. So if you can reuse logic, then use calculation groups, of course. But in terms of performance itself, uh, it's the same. I mean, DEX, DEX will be the same. OK, thank you. Uh, if there is any other question, please feel free to ask that. Otherwise, we can wrap it up. So thank you, thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, and we learned a lot from you. Thanks, and thanks hope. for inviting me. And it was a pleasure to present. Thank you, everyone, yeah, for joining. Thank you, and hope in the future we can have another meeting because you mentioned during the presentation we need to have another session for that date column and day date table. So maybe we can arrange that. Yeah, so, sure. Why not? Yeah. More than happy to have you again in this Thanks. financial, Thank in this Power BI user group. Thank you. Thanks great, a lot. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your time with us. I want to say thanks to the Microsoft team, to the community team, to give us this chance to gather as a community and improve our knowledge. Thank you again, Nicola, and hope to see you soon. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Take care. All the yeah. best.